Okay. Okay. So welcome everyone. Welcome to our today's IBIM talk. And uh, um, we are delighted to have Professor Dem Demis Sapsis, hopefully I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> to give us a um, very interesting talk on the likelihood weighted active learning with application to Bayesian optimization, uncertainty quantification, and decision making in high dimensions. So, firstly, I will give a brief introduction of Professor Sipsis. Dr. Sipsis is a professor of mechanical and ocean engineering at MIT. He received a diploma in ocean engineering from Technical University of Athens, Greece, and a PhD in mechanical and ocean engineering from MIT. Before he becoming a faculty at MIT, he was appointed research scientist at the current Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University. He has also been a visiting faculty at ETH Zurich. Professor Sipsis works lies on the interface of the nonlinear dynamic systems, probability uh, stick modeling and the data driven methods a particular emphasis of his work is the formulation of mathematical methods for the prediction statistical quantification and optimization of complex engineering and physical systems such as turbulent fluid flows nonlinear waves in the ocean and extreme ship motions he has received numerous awards and recognitions, including three Young Investigator Awards, Navy, Army, and Air Force Research Office, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Award, and more recently, the Bodosaki Award on the basic science mathematics. So I will now leave the floor to Professor Sipsis, and let's welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, nice introduction. Thank you for inviting me. So um, this is a uh, work uh, done with my group, several uh, very talented postdocs and students. I will go through them as we move uh, through the slides. Uh, and the emphasis of this work is um, the, well, the, the, the general framework, as you will see, is that we have some sort of experiment, simulation, very expensive, and the question, we want to quantify certain statistical properties or we want to optimize certain parameters of this uh, very expensive black box or uh, experiment. And we are uh, trying to develop algorithms to do that efficiently and efficient means with very few samples, right? So let me give you some motivation of this work. So we start with resilience and reliability, notion engineering, um, ocean engineering, we have several problems like that where, uh, again, we have, you can think of those as a black box where we have a set of random parameters. Uh, here is described waves, right? Um, you see a coastal region heated by waves. So you have the distribution of the waves, presumably, <clears throat> and then through again an experiment or uh, or a model you may be able to uh, obtain a vector describing the structural response right for its x for its uh, wave uh, and the goal is to quantify statistical properties of this response so um, the, the the bottleneck here is what is that you have to run this for several um, inputs for several waves uh, either it, this is a ship that is rolling or or a coastal region that is being hit by waves and uh, the challenge there is that the time for computation meaning the wall time uh, versus the time interval of the computation right it's it's despite the effort we're doing in numerical modeling this is still a number that is close to one right for 3d cfd it's actually can be smaller than one uh, for potential solvers, solvers it's much much solver i mean it's much much faster meaning that 
you can run uh, in one minute of simulation, you know, like 20 minutes of, of, of uh, computational time. Um, but uh, we have to keep in mind that the classification societies, the Navy, they need to characterize events with returning period of 100 to 1000 years, right? These are really rare, but also very important. And therefore, uh, with this type of, of, of ratios, it's more or less important possible, right? Even in huge machines. Um, similar problems for effects of climate change, right? We want to characterize events. Uh, X in this case, the input is the random vector describing large scales. The output is, is the small scales, which are typical I mean, typically the, the, the highly relevant things when we are trying to do risk analysis, policy making. Again, R is close to one. So, and this is even in a, in a relatively big machine. Um, so again, we have to do some sort of targeted uh, simulations instead of just waiting for the extreme events to be picked randomly, right, through the algorithm. So, and then the, the, another case I will be uh, discussing is optimization, right? So we are moving away from the quantification problem. This is uh, a, a very, like a prototype system, the, the, it's called the, the, the fluidic pinball, where you have these three cylinders, they rotate uh, to our desire, right? And then we are trying to find um, a control law an open loop control law that will allow us to minimize uh, the way. And again, the question is, how do you do that? Like what, what optimization techniques? There are techniques, right, that people are using, we will compare. And um, another experiment that we will be demonstrating our methods is a turbulent jet with uh, six uh, mini jets that are orthogonal to the main jet. And the question again is, how do you define a control law that achieves a specific objective? So the, the difference here is that in the loop, we don't have um, a computational method. We don't have um, you know, a solver, a CFD solver. We have an actual experiment. Finally, we will be talking about also optimal sensor placement. Um, we will uh, be discussing about uh, how one can optimize the location of sensors and uh, some problems on optimal trajectory planning, right? So these are all can be fitted in this general framework of how should we pick the um, simulations or the, uh, the path, how to make decisions in order to have the fastest convergence either to the optimum or uh, to obtain the desired statistics. So popular UQ and optimization methods in, in, in mechanical engineering, ocean engineering, this involve, of course, reduced order models combined with Monte Carlo, important sampling, right? Um, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, polynomial chaos, uh, older days. Linearization in Pinner Kinchin, very, very popular, especially in the civil and industrial engineering community, and statistical linearizations. I mean, all of them, you know, they have advantages and, and disadvantages. They have been studied thoroughly through the decades. And then for optimization, of course, a joint method, surrogate based uh, ideas, genetic algorithm, Bayesian optimization, which we will be talking about. So what is the special twist here, right? Why, why um, we are, uh, what, what is the special source if you want? We want to minimize the number of experiments, right? So this is the, the number one goal. We have a very expensive experiment or a very expensive um, simulation, and we don't want to repeat that millions of times. So a lot of methods like important sampling, right? Um, Monte Carlo, all these are basically out of the game simply because we cannot afford to, to simulate things for even thousands of times. We're trying, like we're aiming on things or the order of 10 to 100 you know, points. So what is the, the, the basic idea we will be relying on? It's that we put emphasis on the inputs that modify the output. So we will try to adaptively explore the parameter space with a special emphasis on the inputs that gives us the big outputs. 
So let me uh, review very quickly this active learning loop. This is uh, more or less standard for, um, for in the active sampling, I mean, the active learning community. The idea is that you start with some initial data, right? Input output pairs. Uh, the input X can be a high dimensional input. Y is typically low dimensional. We do some sort of probabilistic regression. We will talk about Gaussian process regression, but we will also show results with ensemble neural networks. We select the new input with an acquisition function. And basically the idea is that through the probabilistic regression, we don't only obtain um, an interpolator uh, for the quantity of interest, but also uncertainty bounds, right? So we will be using this uncertainty bounds to identify where is the next best point that one should run. Um, either the experiment or the simulation, and then complement with this new experiment the initial data and repeat this loop until we can do effective, I mean, good and certain quantification or good optimization. So a few words about Gaussian process regression, although, as I said, it's not the only method that one can, can employ to do regression, probabilistic regression. We start with some data. We assume there is a Gaussian prior for the unknown function. And then we condition, this is a known parametric method, you condition on um, the data, and that gives you, as I said, um, uh, an average mean um, interpolator, and also some correlation, which of course you can use to obtain uh, the variance at its location. As I said, we will also be using ensemble um, operator neural networks in this case, and I will talk about it a bit later. So the key thing here is the acquisition function, right? How, what, is the, what is the acquisition function? The acquisition function is basically a criterion that will tell us where to sample next, okay? Using the regression, the probabilistic regression we have obtained. So here you see an example. Um, as I said, the, the blue, the, the solid blue is the interpolation. The dust lines are the, uh, is, is the uncertainty. And then you have to decide where to sample next. So uh, of course, at the point that you sample, the uncertainty goes to zero, right? So then you can start playing games. You can say, OK, I will sample in regions where I have the maximum estimated uncertainty or I will sample in a region where I maximally reduce the integrated variance. Or, I mean, there are other ideas based on mutual information, but these are expensive because mutual information requires the full density, the joint density of input and output. And this is an expensive thing to compute, especially if X lives in high dimensions. Moreover, the, the mutual information it asymptotically converges to basically the integrated variance reduction. So th these are more or less the criteria that, that have been employed in the literature very successfully occasionally. But let's see why this is not these are not working for our purposes. So we're motivated by the problem of extremes. And um, the, the picture that we have in mind is something that happens in, in a variety of dynamical systems, especially related to fluids and turbulence. Uh, well, the idea is that you have a high dimensional attractor. This is the shaded region. And then you have these islands of instabilities that you see here. This is the green region. And then once in a while, your system, your trajectory crosses this, this instability, these dangerous islands, and you have an extreme event, right? So if you just focus on reducing the uncertainty in highly probable regions, then you will end up getting a very good approximation of whatever your quantity of interest is over the shaded region, but you will be missing the, the extreme event stuff, which is not necessarily associated with high probability. On the other hand, if you focus only on the extreme events, you may end up, if you know where they are, right? Because this is not easy, but assume you know where they are approximately and you start exploring these regions, then you may end up exploring things or spending resources, simulation resources for, for these green islands, which may be completely exotic, right? They may not be visited at all. So you are interested in something in between, right? Both something that may be visited but also it is associated with some sort of extreme behavior. 
So we have to start thinking, how are we gonna do that? We have to start thinking in terms of output probability densities instead of the map itself, because everything I showed you so far focused on the map, on, on approximating this map from the parameter space to the output space. So how we do that? Well, for each, for the, for the solid curve, the probabilistic regression, the average, we can associate a probability density function, right? We call it P of Y, and this is simply the, we have the distribution of X, we have the map Y bar of X, the approximation of it. We can very quickly compute the probability density function of Y bar. And we can do the same for a perturbed version of the map, which is what? It's the mean value Y N of X, plus some beta perturbation where sigma n, it's again estimated by the probabilistic regression. That gives you two densities. It gives you P of Y bar and it gives you P of Y bar plus, right? The perturbed. Now, these should match to each other when you have good convergence, right? But keep in mind that that does not imply that the opposite is true. So if the PDFs match with each other, it doesn't mean that the map has converged everywhere. It has converged only in regions associated with highly probable X and very extreme, I mean, extreme outputs of Y. So it does exactly what you, what you want in that sense. But the question is, how do you solve that? How do you solve this optimization problem? So we, we choose this, I mean, this acquisition function that you see here. We basically choose inputs through the lenses of the output PDF or the PDF for the quantity of interest. And this is to minimize this L1 distance between the logarithms of the PDFs. Now you see that we are using the logarithms because we want to emphasize extreme events. Uh, so this is work that, that is, dates back yes, several years uh, with, with a former uh, student. Uh, Mustafa. So uh, why is this, this a good uh, acquisition function for our purposes? Remember, we are interested in the PDF of Y, and if you read the PDF of Y, you can express it through essentially a term that, that shows what is the information for the model. This is the input-output relationship, but also the information for the input. So here, we have this big step compared with the previous acquisition functions I presented that we have direct encoding of the information for the model, input output relationship, Y, X. If you remember, I will go back a few slides just to, so for the uncertainty sampling, we are not taking into account the input, the output of X. Same thing for integrated variance reduction. We are only focusing on the uncertainty of X and the probability of X. So output is completely missing from the picture. So this is fixed if you use this sort of, um, of metric. Uh, I'm sorry. So this sort of metric that I described here. But what is the challenge? The challenge is that you have to find this X star that minimizes this. And this is a hard optimization problem. So we were able to demonstrate this approach and this paper on, a, on essentially a two-dimensional problem. We start with the John Shop spectral density, random waves hitting an offshore platform that you see here. This is simulated using SPH. And um, the way we do it is that we parameterize the waves with two-dimensional nonlinear parameterization that involves wave groups with prescribed length scale and prescribed amplitude. This amplitude, these two parameters, they follow uh, a probability density function that one can find pretty easily from the spectrum. And then the question is what wave groups one should simulate to identify the extreme event statistics, not only the extreme event statistics, the full PDF for um, the vertical bending moment in this case, right? So it's the bending moment that we're interested in. So we repeat this optimization loop so we run a CFD experiment, we complement the, the data set that we have, we run this output PDF acquisition function, so we have to solve an optimization problem, we find what is the next most informative wave group, we run it with a CFD experiment, and then we repeat. And we're able to show excellent convergence with, with just 16 simulations, right, in this, in this problem. But what is the elephant in the room, right? Why is this uh, not uh, good enough? 
Well, the problem is that this optimization problem I just presented, it's solvable for dimensions two to three. You cannot really go to high dimensionalities. For realistic C states, as well as other problems, you know, they require at least order of tens or more uh, dimensionality. So the question is, if we can derive an alternative acquisition function that is appropriate for higher dimensional spaces? The answer is yes. So there is an asymptotic upper bound uh, for the um, metric or the criterion I described that is given um, by basically this weighted, we call it the likelihood weighted uh, uncertainty. So what you see is the uncertainty of your uh, regression weighted according to the probability density function of the input and then inverse weighted according to the probability density function of the output, right? Conditioned on a given input. So we, we derived this bound that was in 2020. And as I said, why is this good? Well, because for the upper bound that you see on the right, it is straightforward to compute its gradient. So you can use all these conjugate gradient methods to optimize. And um, moreover, uh, it, it preserves all the nice properties that we want, primarily the fact that it gives inputs with high probability, I mean, emphasis on inputs with high probability, but also it emphasizes inputs that lead to large outputs, right? And this appears through this ratio. So you have this balance of highly probably inputs, but this is basically has, has a break. Well, it is, um, it should be comparable with like the, the high probability with also the importance in terms of the output. So we call this the likelihood weighted um, ratio or criteria. And um, the next question we asked ourselves is that, all right, we have this, this criteria that makes sense intuitively, how close it is to, to the optimal, right? Or can we define an optimality uh, notion for this case? Course, this is hard right because you want to find to minimize the next i'm sorry to select the next experiment x star so that the cell one difference is is minimized what is that this is the log of the pdf obtained by the regression minus the log of the pdf obtained by the exact map but of course the exact map is not known so to overcome this we uh, define this optimal acquisition process where we take the supremum over this, um, this reproducing kernel Hilbert space. It's a functional space and it's what, what it is, H of K. It's essentially all the functions that interpolate the data set that we have up until this moment, right? So think of all the possible functions that go through the points that, that we have. And then we define the supremum of this, of this distance and we minimize the supremum. So we have this minimax problem that is obviously intractable, right? It's defined in a functional space. And this is where we were able to, to make an important step by characterizing this, um, this quantity, this uh, supremum over a functional space based on theory of the theory of Gaussian process regression and some additional results, we're able to show that this supremum asymptotically, meaning for small sigma, it takes this, again, likelihood weighted uh, form that you see on the right, um, but this is not exactly what we had as an upper bound, but we will see its connection. So the good news here is that we are able again to uh, derive an asymptotically optimal criterion directly by starting from first principles and using ideas of uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, Gaussian process regression, and some additional uh, results. Now let's see how this, I mean, this, this uh, term on the right, which is again, it's a weighted version of the uncertainty, how close it is to the upper bound. Well, it's as close as a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So you can see that we apply a Cauchy-Schwarz uh, step and we're able to derive a tight upper bound for, um, for, for that, that gives us essentially the likelihood weighted ratio. So in that sense, we have a good idea of how close we are into the optimal. And this is essentially uh, uh, an optimal result asymptotically for small sigma. 
What about larger sigma? We have already done the expansion in higher order terms. It's very interesting because you start obtaining properties of the geometry of the map, Asian and so on. So this is work I will not uh, present today, but uh, you can in principle uh, go to higher orders of this criterion and derive higher order versions with respect to sigma. And then the other uh, possible question is why do we end up using the, the term uh, here of the, I mean, that we obtained from Cossius Schwartz and not the original one? Well, numerically, it's much more uh, convenient because you have sigma n square and with Gaussian process regressions, a lot of things, a lot of calculations can be carried out analytically. So that's why we are not using the term on the left, which is the original asymptotic criteria. Uh, I will skip that. I will go to some examples just to start getting some ideas. So this is a certain quantification for a 20 dimensional linear function. Um, the linear function is, is what you see here, upper left, right? The coefficients have an interesting distribution. So you see that AM, it's the uh, coefficients of the linear function. For low indices, this is the black curve. For low indices, these are more or less negligible. For high indices, these are important, right? Red, on the other hand, is um, the variance of its input direction. And uh, you see that it's more or less comparable. It's important. It's probably less important with uh, for indices close to the middle, right, around 8 to 12. So we apply different criteria. As I said in the, at the beginning, our goal is to quantify the variance of this model, the variance of F or the variance of the output Y. We start using Monte Carlo samples with just sample according to the input distribution. And this is the convergence. The same thing happens with input weighted criteria or uncertainty sampling, if you want, uh, in the graded variance reduction. Convergence is very, very slow. And this is no surprise because Again, this criterion, the input weight, it does not really take into account what is happening to the output, the fact that there are only a few directions that matter for the output. The, the likelihood weighted very fast identifies that the high indices uh, are the ones that matter for the output. And this is where it starts choosing samples from, right? So you can see it here. What you see here is the index with respect to the number of of samples, we start in the standard input uh, integrated advanced reduction criterion. It starts sampling the most uncertain uh, inputs. So it starts from 20 and zero and moves towards the center. In the likelihood weighted, it correctly detects that most of the action happens for high indices and it focuses there until it, it basically starts uniformly sampling between uh, different inputs. Okay, this is an application to the statistics of vertical bending moments for SIPs. It's a very long problem. I will not be able to discuss all the technical details, but the idea is that we are representing the stochastic C through a Cajun lab expansion in random wave groups of finite duration. Um, we are also representing the VBM time series, the vertical bending moment time series, in terms of, of uh, finite, uh, um, finite series. And the idea is to try to identify a map between the characteristics of the wave group and uh, the characteristics of the um, coefficients that, that, that gives us the VBM, right? So this is done using the large amplitude motion uh, program, LAMP. So it's a, it's a, it's a full CFD solver. And um, as I said, there are many technical details here that. I'm happy to discuss uh, later in the Q&A, but the biggest one is how you choose the length of the wave group, because if you choose it very small, then obviously the KL uh, series will converge very fast, but you will miss all the transient stuff, right? All the transient behaviors if you have very short wave groups. On the other, but that will result in increased model uncertainty. If you have increased T, on the other hand, increased length of the wave groups, you will have inevitably slow KL convergence, which means a higher dimensional space, which means higher epistemic uncertainty, and then other things go wrong. You know, Gaussian process regression may not be effective and so on. So here we are able to, 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 to solve this problem by uh, some, some additional ideas. 
but uh, when and then we are able to run this optimal selection of wave groups and you can see that um, we can quantify the PDF for the vertical bending moments acting on the sieve. This is at the mid sieve section with just 44 uh, experiments, um, which, which is very like uh, 44 experiments, like the, just to give you an idea, the ground truth, what we call ground truth here, um, it takes uh, thousands uh, of, of uh, simulations um, to be obtained. And also I want to emphasize the non-Gaussian structure, uh, the non-trivial structure of this, uh, this PDF. Another example uh, that we were recently able to, uh, to demonstrate these ideas is a dispersive wave model for weak turbulence. Um, here, this is the MMT model, the Maida McClough and the Bach model. Uh, here you see uh, some realizations, right? X, space and time. And interestingly, this developed these extreme events that you see here. And the question is how you quantify the statistics of these extreme events or Inversely, what initial conditions are the ones that eventually lead to this um, uh, extreme event statistics? I'm sorry, let me. Okay, so what we deal here is uh, we are employing uh, what is called ensemble uh, depot net. So the reason we are abandoning Gaussian process regressions in this case is because the dimensionality of the, of the input space is very large, right? So how we approximate the initial conditions through um, Cahur and Loeb expansion, again, uh, periodic basically Fourier modes. And um, we have uh, theta is the random parameter. Apologies. <coughs> It takes the random parameter. Um, and uh, as I said, the regression in this case is performed with using uh, an ensemble neural network. Um, the quantity of interest is the maximum, the spatial maximum. And uh, the variance is given by the ensemble of uh, different neural networks, right? Our goal again is to reduce the log of the PDF error. So here I will show you results using the uh, likelihood weighted uncertainty sampling criteria. In this plot, you see the trained uh, deep neural network model. This is for a two dimensional approximation of the input space. You see how the exploration is performed, the exploitation, which is the weight that we're using. And this is the value of the acquisition function. And very quickly, we're able to recover the output PDF. This is for an eight dimensional example where uh, we project things in a two dimensional uh, map using multidimensional scaling. Uh, and again, you are able to see how this eight dimensional problem is being tackled. Very quickly, and this is how the sampling is performed, right, over different regions. So how does this compare with uh, Latin hypercube sampling and standard uncertainty sampling? Again, this is a much higher dimensional problem. Um, and uh, here you see the 20 dimensional case, 20 dimensional initial conditions. You see how things basically diverge with Latin hypercube sampling. Uh, things are very, very, very slow. And uh, if we use standard uncertainty sampling, uh, it's the green uh, curve. Again, the convergence is very, very slow. And uh, I apologize for the background noise. Okay. So while if we use the likelihood weighted uh, criteria, we are able to get nice convergence, uh, uniform convergence of the uh, extreme event statistics. So how initial conditions are being chosen? 
Well, if we use standard Latin hypergroup sampling, essentially extreme events are only sampled only if you sample extreme event initial conditions, right? So you see here the, uh, uh, the initial conditions that basically lead to extreme events are the ones that are already extreme, which is the problem with, with standard lighting hypercube sampling. You cannot really detect extreme events. You just have to wait when these appear on their own. If we use this likelihood weighted sampling on the other uh, side, you see that we start with uh, banning initial conditions and our unsuspecting waves that eventually lead to future magnitudes. So here I'm showing an example. You see what is the uh, initial condition that we, we detect, it's the black line that you see here that doesn't, it's not really uh, a suspect to produce an extreme event, right? It's not an extreme event itself. And then rapidly it converges to an extreme event after t plus 30, right? So you see that nonlinear focusing happens and that leads to uh, a rock wave. So it does work. And as I said, the key thing here is that we're able to do that not with Gaussian process regression, simply because Gaussian process regression, it's not able to operate in this number of samples or in this dimensionality, but rather with um, ensemble neural networks. And then the last thing I want to discuss in the remaining 10, 15 minutes is how we use these ideas to perform optimization, right? So all the problems I've presented so far focused on uncertain quantification on extreme event statistics. So for the UQ problem, the goal is to achieve convergence for the output PDF, as I mentioned. For, uh, oops. For optimization, on the other hand, we're not only interested to, to recover the map or the statistics associated with the map, but we're also interested to identify a local minimum, right, of this, of this function. So we have to add this to our uh, criterion. And um, this is where we obtain this uh, criteria for active learning for optimization. Essentially, it's what we had before. So here you see the integrated variance reduction. But on top of that, we also add a term associated with minimizing the function itself. Lower confidence bound is another version that involves uncertainty sampling plus the quantity we're interested to minimize, probability of improvement, expect improvement. These are all standard criteria, right? These are criteria from Bayesian optimization. We are able to modify those with the likelihood uh, weighted version uh, that you see here. And um, this is the likelihood weighted IVR and the great device reduction where again, you can see the criteria I presented before, but this time we're also adding the value of the quantity we want to minimize. And we have the lower confidence bound. This is demonstration. I don't want to spend a lot of time. This is for standard benchmark functions. We are basically beating, uh, you know, all the all the possible acquisition functions in the literature uh, for the six-dimensional Hartmann, ten-dimensional Michalowicz. Like there, there are several of those. As I said, I don't want to to spend a lot of time. I want to focus primarily on this uh, problem, which is a collaboration with, uh, with a wonderful colleague in uh, Harbin Institute of Technology, Bernard and his group. The idea is what I presented before, it's this open loop uh, control experiment. We have a jet, turbulent jet, um, and we have these uh, six mini jets that we uh, control through this um, parameter. So this is the control law, it's an open loop uh, control. And we have these uh, parameters, AI and phi that define when the mini jets begin to, 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 uh, to operate and when they're turned off, right? So we have six times two, it's a 12 dimensional uh, parameter space. And the objective function is the average velocity, uh, five distances uh, downstream, right? What is the experiment in this case? Uh, we have, while the budget permits, uh, we select the next best point based on the acquisition function that we will discuss perform the experiment, we augment the data set, we update the surrogate model, and then we repeat the loop, right? So that's, that's the idea. 
And let's see how things work. So here we have the uh, evolution, if you want, of the, of the quantity of interest using different um, experimental campaigns, right? So we are using the expected improvement is the black curve. We are running uh, three experiments for its method and we're taking the average. The red curve is the integrated variance reduction and the, the dash curve is the likelihood weighted Bayesian optimization that I described before. The optimization landscape, you can see it again, projected in a two dimensional space. It's a 12 dimensional problem. We project in a 20, two dimensional space and you see it on the, on the right, I'm sorry. And uh, we're able to obtain with the likelihood weighted function, we're able to, to obtain uh, significantly improved performance compared with the other two criteria, but also 8% better than results obtained with uh, genetic programming, right? And especially with genetic programming, we are able to do that with an order of magnitude less experiments. Um, in particular, the solution we are able to obtain, so you see on the left is the uncontrolled jet, on the right is the controlled jet. It's very nicely it, uh, it consists of periodically generated mushroom structures that also perform a helical motion. They combine oscillating behavior back and forth and enhanced mid-term rate. The interesting thing is that this optimal solution that we discovered, optimal control law that leads to this solution, it combines all these features that have been found independently in the past, but as, as a separate optimal, right? So we're able to to discover an optimal solution that combines all of them simultaneously. That was really interesting result of this work. So uh, one more uh, direction where we are applying this is for informative path planning. The idea is that you have a vehicle, right? You have an unknown domain and you're trying to identify uh, a local uh, maximum, or I'm sorry, a global maximum. You can think of this as an oil spill, right? That is unknown, you have some, some vehicles. And then the question is how these vehicles should, um, should move so that they can recover uh, the, uh, not, not just the field itself, but primarily the region associated with extreme values of the, of the unknown field, right? So the idea is that you have some observations, right? Your vehicle just randomly moves and then collects some observations about location and concentration. We build a surrogate model. And then based on that, we are optimizing the next destination of our vehicle so that we can detect and characterize the region associated with the larger concentration. Um, uh, the optimization we're using here is one decision step forward. We're not doing, so it's a myopic, we're not doing multiple decisions, but I mean, forward, but this can be modified. There is no restriction here. Um, <clears throat> and we assume that the vehicle also collects information between decisions, right, between checkpoints. Um, as I said, the, the idea is that likelihood weighted criteria should perform better here because it emphasizes anomalies, and this is what we're trying to, to discover. And um, we also have the capability of incorporating prior beliefs in this, in this process uh, about where the maximum may be, right? So this is again some results uh, with with standard I mean with standard benchmark functions. This is the Mikalevich function. You see the anomaly and the modified Rosenborg function. Um, I will show you uh, a movie that uh, basically demonstrates the idea. Just to 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 make things easier, on the top uh, two top plots, you see the results from a vehicle that is being guided according to the integrated balance reduction method and on the bottom you see the one with uh, the likelihood weighted criteria the second uh, column is the reconstructed map and on the last column you see the comparison in terms of performance right the distance from the minimum the identified minimum and the regret so you see the trajectory that the two vehicles obtain So far, they are doing similarly. At this stage now, it's interesting that 
the vehicle uh, guided by the standard integrated advantage reduction will basically focus where the prior says to go, right? Prior is basically some prior information which is sending it at the center. The likelihood weighted guided vehicle, it understands that there is a local maximum at the, at the bottom left. And because it is guided by a likelihood weighted ratio, it will start spending its time around there. But it also explores to make sure there is nothing left. So there is a better balance between exploration and exploitation. As you can see, this is what we have here right so you see that the performance is 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 uh, the difference is very big this also has to do with the fact that we are giving adversarial information so the, the integrated advantage reduction criterion heavily relies on this information and therefore it gets stuck and it's very hard to to identify the global maximum although it went through it right so you see that it started from the local maximum but it's never able to recover it because it doesn't give enough weight. Um, I want to focus on the second example where we have applied this in this artificial experiment of discovering um, a trench. Uh, this is outside Japan. Uh, again, we are giving adversarial prior for the trench uh, location and we're able to recover very, I mean, quickly uh, the, the characteristics of this, of this trench. You see the difference between the likelihood weighted criteria, which is the blue and the red versus the standard uh, criteria. So I think I have, let me see, I have four minutes. So let me, let me close with this example. And this is joint work with uh, Paris Perticalis from UPenn, where we are applying this for um, optimal sensor placement or a prototype system for this is multi-arm bandit problems. Is the is that you have this uh, multi-arm uh, uh, bandit uh, device, and uh, each time you select um, uh, you select a lever, then you get some gain: mu one, mu two, mu k. Of course, you don't know these gains a priori, right? And uh, the question is, what is the best strategy to maximize your gains, right? So, for a sequence of decisions, we define the total expected regret, which is essentially the gain we have by choosing this particular, um, uh, you know, um, uh, bandit versus minus the maximum possible gain, right? Which we assume to be known. So we are trying to identify a strategy or we are trying to identify where is the maximum uh, gain in this case. Um, we are applying this for an optimal sensor location. As I said, this is a data set collected in the Intel Berkeley Research Lab. They have essentially 50, 55 thermostats. They measure the temperature inside the lab. And the question is, if you cannot, I mean, um, activate all the sensors, but you want to choose which sensor you should activate every time to identify where is your local, I mean, where's your, your, your maximum temperature, which of those sensors you should activate. So this is a standard benchmark problem for this community. And uh, you see three different snapshots, T1, T2, T3, how the temperature field looks like and how we are choosing the uh, thermostats, which thermostats we're choosing to characterize the behavior. On the left, you see the performance using different uh, optimization algorithms. This is expected improvement, it's the blue. Thompson sampling is a very popular one uh, for this community, it's the orange. And then we have the upper confident mounts with different um, variations. Likelihood weighted is the red one where we clearly have uh, the best performance again, due to the fact that um, you know, these methods are designed to identify uh, extreme anomalies. And this is a problem of extreme anomalies, so this is no surprise. Uh, we have applied this also for uh, another more realistic data set uh, in um, identifying uh, pollutants, uh, the nitrogen dioxide. Um, this is in Madrid. And again, we're able to demonstrate what with, with the minimum number of sensor activations, we can identify where is the maximum pollution. So I want to close with some challenges. Um, 
And these are associated primarily with the fact that uh, it is important. Everything I presented, you know, ensemble neural networks, uh, Gaussian process uh, regression, these are non-parametric models, but there is important need to combine uh, these ideas with um, models that encode some physics. I'm a big fan of reduced order models. Um, exactly solvable if you want models that come from prototype systems because these allow for enough flexibility to then encode uh, information from data um, but this is definitely a direction that one has to go uh, the reason is because you know no matter how good your regression is you will always be suffering by things associated with hyperparameter optimization large number of samples, uh, vector outputs. Uh, I mean, I mentioned some of these difficulties when I was talking about the SIP motion problem, um, high dimensional inputs, high dimensional outputs. This is always a problem and you need, like if you have physics, it's important to, to use them to, to use physics to regularize uh, this, this non-parametric representations. Um, and there are, of course, a lot of ideas along this direction. People are working on this for, for decades, if not centuries. So I want to summarize. Um, I presented the new class of acquisition functions, likelihood-weighted acquisition functions that are uh, have been demonstrated in high-dimensional problems. Uh, we have also discussed the asymptotic uh, optimality uh, in terms of uh, Gaussian process regression. And uh, we have also formulated acquisition functions for Bayesian optimization. And uh, I have shown you some applications in um, problems related to turbulence, uh, stream events, or ship motions. Uh, and I think, again, I want to emphasize that there are limitations, and these are associated with high dimensionality. So this is something we should keep in mind. Uh, I'd like to thank several members of my group particular Antoine and Ethan who did most of this work. Um, Steven and Mustafa work on uh, ship motions and uh, all the work on um, the original acquisition function. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Professor Sixis, for your interesting talk. And uh, anyone got any questions? Oh, yeah, we got one question from one hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have two questions. First of all, the sure. Themistocles is shortened to something? It's Themis. What do you? Yeah. It's just Themis, is it? Yes. Is that right? Yeah. First six letters. Yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. Um, I love that talk. Can we go back to slide uh, 39, I think, two slides back? And forgive me if I missed this part. I, I did go up to the kitchen to make a tea. I was listening the whole time. But that's a capsized canoe, is that right? No, no, no. This is... Um, um, this is a, um, a naval ship. Uh, it's something that is close to DDG 1000, and it is um, uh, subjected to head seas. So what you see is um, basically we are interested to study vertical bending moments, right? In this case, uh, I so get it. you have you have the bow getting inside and outside the water. You have slamming events. You have... So it's actually a is it is it a surfaced uh, submarine then, is that right? It's not a submarine. We just don't plot or we don't show the, the superstructures. So there, got it. we're showing only the hull. Well, I'm glad I asked. I missed, I missed that. I mean, yeah. I was impressed that you were modeling a capsized canoe, but I'm even more impressed now to see what it <laughs> This is designed not to capsize or not to. The, 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 the most important thing here is the loads. Like it's impossible to, at least for this hull to, or this design, to make it sink. It's hard. Yeah, beautiful work, beautiful lecture. Thank you, Dennis. Sure, thank you. Um, like, uh, Professor Sepsis, like, I'm going uh, 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 to like, uh, go next to ask. 
uh, several questions and uh, I'll choose like my time wisely. As always, it's always beautiful to hear your talk and hear your lecture. Um, to begin with, um, you mentioned the biggest challenge you pointed out is um, uh, the number of pyramids. Like, you know, it's gonna be challenging for optimization to learning like you know, this. And uh, in your, your past, like in the like ensemble, like a deep net, like uh, you have like, you know, 5,000 data points on the things. Mm -hmm. For GP, uh, if I remember correctly, even for sparse GP, like it's, it's like a computation resources scale up with M N square. Um, mm -hmm. What about like uh, the ensemble deep net? When the number of like, you know, data point flowing more is like, uh, what's the, like, you know, the computational cost? No, deep on net, like neural nets, they scale very well with the number of data points. You know, the more data points, the better. It's not, uh, it's not an issue like the training happens sequentially. In GP, you have to invert a matrix. If you recall, the dimension of this matrix is essentially the dimensionality of your input space times the number of data points. So, it starts, I mean, for these problems that you show, we don't even uh, have comparison with GP. Just to go back here. Yeah, for this case, 20 dimensional, just to, to give you a sense, right? 20 dimensional input space times 2000 points, it means uh, like what, 40,000 dimensional matrix for GP. Again, GP, it's inconceivable to operate in this regime. Right. So yeah. The other hand, neural nets, they have no problem. You know, they scale very well with, with data points. Yeah. I mean, even for sparse GP, like, it's still like too much. But uh, on the other hand, like, you know, for, you need to choose like, you know, like, uh, uh, like, uh, like, you know, the, some type of a neural net, like a structure of neural net, right? It's like, uh, well, like for GP, you need to choose the kernel, but how do you choose like a neural, neural net? Because it's not going to change in long term, you cannot change that in long term. You have like a fixed number of points, like a you know, number of layers, all the things. I will tell you, I will tell you this here. So this is not a big problem, like how to choose the architecture. Remember, we're not trying to model any dynamics here. We're trying to model a response function, right? So this is just a static function. So any vanilla neural net should be able to do the job. The problem with neural nets is how you are sure whether this ensemble neural net where we start with random weights and then we train you know every time with a neural net and we obtain another neural net the question is or the, the challenge is that we don't have rigorous theory for neural nets the way we have for gps right and um when we do estimation of the uncertainty with uh, for with neural nets although it works we basically uh, rely on the hope that it will work. <laughs> there is no guarantee it's going to work. On GPs, again, you have guarantees as long as it works that what you have is correct, right? It's backed up mm -hmm. by theory. It, it's backed up by, uh, by rigorous results. Uh, neural nets, I mean, we have seen uh, anecdotally, anecdotically, I can tell you that with neural net, we have seen a tremendous robustness. Like it's, it's, uh, it's, it works very well. But again, you have to take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, well, you have to rely on my word if you want. <laughs> so it's not, uh, it's not something I can guarantee, you know, that, that, that if you change problems, it's all about the uncertain quantification, right? The, 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 um, this component that I call here, let me see, the sigma. Right, how you estimate yeah. sigma with the neural net, that's the big issue. Yeah, that's true. Everything so, else with neural nets is good, like uh, scaling, all, all these things are good. Exactly, like, you know, GP, like, you know, like, you know, for like, you know, three, two sound data, like, you know, it takes like a really long time to even. No, no, it's not working. It's not working. Even for four, 300, 400 data points, it's uh, like you can start doing tricks, as you said, sparse GP, other stuff, but. Um, it's not, uh, you, you have to be very careful. Like, it's not something that at least someone, you know, who is not an expert can do. Yeah, because I'm having like, you know, um, roughly like 128 buoy in my hand, can like, you know, floating, like you know, moving in different parts and trying to like, you know, 
model like you know greenhouse gas emission in Westlake. Like with that, like you know, just uh, stay there, like and then stay there for three months. And uh, of course, like you want, I want to do like adaptively to find a location where it's like you know the source of like you no know, uh, uh, methane. Like naturally, cricking like you know, it's coming to mind GP, but of course, like it's not doable for this time amount of time, this amount of like a data point. So I was like you know, so captivating by like uh, this. But anyway, so I think I will have more. I have your email to like ask you a more question like later on. So mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, if I can ask one more question, like on slide thirty-seven. Sure. Yes. So, um, so here is like, you know, um, trying to like put optimal sensor location, like, yes. uh, uh, so is this for designing, uh, uh, designing to where to put sensors, all these sensors has already been fixed at this location just okay. to. So this is a benchmark problem, right? So you have, in reality, you have data from all 54 locations, right? So you have temperature data from all the locations. Now, mm -hmm. the, the scenario is the following. Suppose you don't want, or you cannot activate these wireless uh, devices simultaneously mm -hmm. to obtain this data, right? And every time, every day, you want to know what is the maximum temperature in the room. The question then becomes, what protocol should I use or what strategy should I use to detect with the minimum number of activations mm -hmm. the location of the, uh, and the, and the value of the maximum temperature? Mm. So the, for, for benchmark reasons, we know where is the temperature, we know all the temperatures, but we pretend for this experiment that we don't know. And then the question is which ones we activate. Mm. So you here you see on T1, the temperature field looks like that. And I we see. are activating adaptively these sensors and we're able to get the right uh, temperature. I see, I see. Uh, I have more questions, but I'll leave to other people's like, you know, opportunities. So. Okay, shall we get a couple? Um, thank you. Uh, excellent talk, Professor. Um, I'm just uh, trying to understand what will be the trade-off uh, for using this active learning method for like low fidelity methods versus high fidelity methods. For example, for that Navy, um, both Probably. examples yeah well, if you were to say like trying to estimate it's like rao or something um would you choose some high fidelity method with active learning or like just brute force the uh, frequency domain models like you can fidelity? always let me tell you you can always use i mean look the the problem this is a great question first of all number two um you can combine the acquisition function with a multi-fidelity uh, kernel and just do utilize both, right? So you can have, let's say, you have plentiful data from the low fidelity model, and then you want to choose only high fidelity data. You can do the multi-fidelity Gaussian process regression, for example, and then apply the acquisition function on uh, selecting high fidelity data. If you have a range of multi-fidelity uh, models, uh, then you can also optimize how, what, what fidelity you should have every time, not necessarily sample only from high fidelity. But this is all, uh, how can I say, um, standard in the, the literature of multi-fidelity modeling. Um, now, how you use these acquisition functions depends on the particular problem, like for here, for LAMP, for example, um, you, have, you can have, again, different fidelities. You may have a CFD solver, you may have a potential flow solver. Uh, use them both and, and, uh, and decide. But the key thing is the acquisition function here, right? You can combine it later with anything you like. Thank you. All right. So due to the time limit, shall we end here? And thanks again for Professor Seitzix. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. And thank you for uh, the, yeah. The time. yeah, yeah. Thank you. thanks everyone for coming and uh, yeah.